Thank you all for coming for another awesome installment of Landmark's guest speaker series. Uh, my name is Malcolm Miguel Mac. Um, I was Brian's student for like a year and a half. Uh, pretty influential to me in my ecological search for sustainability. Um, Right, so it's my pleasure this evening to introduce a professor of our very own whose commitment to the institution of higher education is second only perhaps to his, his passion for the environment and our obligation towards its protection. Following his involvement with the Peace Corps, during which he worked with villagers in Senegal to foster an understanding of successful management of natural resources, ask him some time about grafting fruit trees in Africa, it's a pretty awesome story. Um, he earned his master's in biology where he studied the defense compounds in aspen trees. Uh, also a pretty awesome story if you ask him about aspen trees. Uh, so he later went on to complete his PhD in natural resources and sustainability at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Ask him about Alaska. It's all about that too. Uh, and then on to Minnesota where he performed research with the U.S. Forest Service at their northern research station. Um, I've had the great opportunity to work closely with Professor Young uh, for about the past year, and I've learned more about our local and global ecological situation than I had ever thought possible. His knowledge and academic approach to natural sciences are as informative as they are welcoming and fun. So without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Brian Young. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Specifically, I'd like to thank Mac for those wonderful, kind words. Um, I'd like to thank Landmark College, and notably Jeff Burgess and the uh, committee for bringing me here tonight. So um, what I'm going to be talking about this evening is uh, the Boro Forest in a time of change. So as Mac mentioned, I did my dissertation work in Alaska, and I still do quite a bit of work there. So that's going to be my main primary focus while discussing some of the broader implications that exist in the boreal forest. So, oh. so this happened to be a view not too far away from where we lived in Fairbanks, um, looking over this large flat expanse here, which is the Tana Valley. Um, looking to the south there into the Alaska Range. And if you notice that this area is definitely a mosaic quilt <coughs> of different vegetation types, um, punctuated by a lot of wetlands. And that's a very key characteristic of the boreal forest in general. And standing here on a south-facing slope, you'll notice that kind of in the foreground, this area happens to be dominated by deciduous trees, notably that of aspen trees on these south facing slopes. While in the valleys, we happen to be much more inundated with black spruce. So the boreal forest in general, it happens to be the largest forested biome on the earth. It is circumpolar in its nature and happens to exist just south of the Arctic tundra and north of the temperate forests. And the key distinguishing line between those two is a, is a mean temperature of about 37 degrees Fahrenheit. So if the mean temperature happens to be colder than 37 degrees Fahrenheit and you're forested, you're in the boreal forest. If you're warmer than that, you happen to be, and you're south of the boreal forest, then you're basically in the temperate forest. In North America, um, this forest happens to cover about 6.5 million square miles and happens to be one third of the total forested area on the planet. And this forest happens to be one of the least studied and least known forests on the planet, even though such a huge expanse of it exists. Where I'm going to be mainly focusing my talk this evening is on the boreal forest of Alaska. But in general, these trends happen to exist um, just as species happen to vary across the circumpolar region. But in general, we find that it is a conifer-dominated system. Uh, 
And in Alaska, it's made up of two major forest types. Um, major characteristic of the Boro Forest as well is that it has very cool soils, um, slow growth, and very slow decomposition rates. And something that maybe a lot of people aren't aware of, but it is a fire-dependent system. Fire exists, and you will hear a lot more about fire and its impacts on the forest um, later this evening. So as I mentioned, the boreal forest, and particularly that of Alaska, is made up of these two different forest types in general. We happen to have in, hmm, hold on a moment, a little clicker died here. Ah. So in green here is a mixed spruce stands, and then in yellow we happen to have aspen and birch, and I'll talk more about those. But if you also notice, this is a map of Alaska. I happen to live here in Fairbanks. And um, between Fairbanks and Anchorage, over half of the population of Alaska exists. And if you also notice, that is basically the road system that exists in Alaska as well. So huge portions of Alaska are relatively unroaded. However, there are communities that live there. These just happen to be some of the larger hubs um, out there, but there is a scattering of 256 communities in Alaska. Oh, sorry, wrong direction. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, in Alaska, it's predominant conifers made up of primarily white, which white spruce, which is this species right here. This happens to be the range of white spruce, so it's basically comes all the way across, and we do have white spruce here in extreme northern Vermont, all across Maine as well. Um, and then black spruce. Black spruce oftentimes you can think of as looks like a Dr. Seuss tree in many ways. Um, very scraggly kind of, um, and it happens to hold its cones up here. This tree is uh, quite unique, and it happens to be the most widely dispersed tree in Alaska, basically a third of the forest is kind of pure black spruce stands. Uh, black spruce in this shape kind of exists up here, and then as you move further to the, to the east and south, um, and Maine actually harvests quite a bit of black spruce, it's actually one of its most harvested species, so it doesn't look so scraggly in Maine, it, uh, it looks a lot nicer and grows a lot faster. Um, on top of the conifers also happen to have deciduous trees, and they're mainly represented by trembling aspen, or also known as quaking aspen, which we have quite a bit here, uh, balsam poplar, which is here in the middle, and then um, Alaskan birch. Alaskan birch is slightly different than what we have here, um, in that we have paper birch or white birch, but the Alaskan birch is, uh, is, is definitely a unique species. Um, Aspen trees are Populus tremuloides, and they actually are the most widely dispersed tree in North America. Uh, and then po balsam poplar, as you can see, kind of its distribution. And then with Betula neo-alaskana, or, or uh, Alaskan birch, this is basically its rough uh, location. Um, Betula neo-alaskana has an interesting tale in that uh, it wasn't until about 10 years ago that it was actually separated from that of paper birch into its own unique species. Um, on top of those, there's some very important shrubs, including alders and willows. Alders are very important in that they're nitrogen fixing. Um, and then willows also, um, these are predominantly found along water courses. Um, and uh, willow diversity in the boreal forests is, is Quite unbelievable. There's over 250 different species of willow in Alaska alone, so it uh, it's quite diverse. And then there's not many um, vascular plants on the forest floor. However, it's dominated by this rich flora of mosses and lichens that uh, that blankets the floor. In some places, this uh, dense moss layer can be several hundred feet thick. So. Um, to several thousand feet thick in some perma rich permafrost areas. Um, as I mentioned, there are over 246 communities in the boreal forest with over 550,000 people. So each of these uh, 
black dots here happens to be a, a community in Alaska. If you remember that the road system is kind of right here. Uh, the climate of the Alaskan Borough Forest is subarctic and uh, cold continental climate. Um, has long severe winters, typically six months of or more below freezing. Relatively short summers, roughly about 100 growing days. And as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of a mean annual temperature of less than 37 degrees. That's kind of the, our unique qualifier. And also, these areas happen to have relatively low precipitation, ranging from about 8 to 25 inches, depending on your location specifically. Uh, these images here, these graphs, happen to be, sorry about that, of Fairbanks. And if you notice that uh, here in Fairbanks, basically the temperature does not start getting, and these are mean temperatures, they do not start getting above freezing until your mid to late April. And then the temperature about, September, you're back below freezing again. So, and then as you notice, the temperature or the precipitation, excuse me, is spikes in the summer months, still relatively dry, um, basically the highest amount, basically end of June, early July, with about two, a little over two inches of rain. Um, and then the winter months, the precipitation, basically as soon as it starts snowing, usually October, um, then it melts there in April. What we're noticing, however, is that uh, the temperatures in Alaska have definitely been changing quite a bit recently. So what, what you see here is this mean line right here. And this mean happens to correspond in, this is a general Alaska, it's 32.7 degrees. And it was the mean for the last 110 years. Um, so from 1949 to today, basically, we noticed that 1949 to roughly 1978, on average, these temperatures were below the 100-year mean. And then there was a noticeable, noticeable shift starting around 1978. And then after that point, we noticed that these temperatures are all roughly above that mean, and the last two years of which are quite a bit above that mean. However, um, these temperatures are not uniform across all of Alaska, nor are they uniform across each of the different seasons. If we notice here at the top, this happens to be Barrow, which is up on the extreme north, not in the forest at all. Its temperatures are by far raising the fastest. So over this time period, it's raised 5.8 degrees. Um, the winter time is really noticeable in that the wintertime temperatures have risen by nearly 8 degrees. If we compare that to Fairbanks, which is kind of in the heart of the boreal region, and so is Delta Junction in Alaska, um, their wintertime temperatures are also quite a bit higher than they were historically. But we also notice that their annual temperatures are about 3.7 and 3.4. So um, there is definitely variation. Alaska is huge. If you lay Alaska kind of on its side, it crosses from New York to California. So there's a lot going on in this large, diverse state. Uh, what we're noticing as well is that, uh, and some predictions show that by 2090, um, basically Alaska could maybe be between 8 and 13 degrees warmer than it currently is based on uh, some of the trends and some of the different emission models that are being used by the IPCC. Uh, precipitation across the state is widely varied, but some of the key things to keep in mind here is the boreal forest of Alaska is kind of this range right here. So it's kind of this green, and then this area right here is the Yukon Plateau, which happens to be really quite dry area, less than 200 millimeters of precipitation a year. And then Fairbanks is not a lot more, roughly. That's about 8 inches, and Fairbanks is about 12 inches of precipitation. Um, and that's kind of typical across most of this region. As you move further to the west, it gets wetter. Um, some of the projected trends in precipitation, what most models indicate is that overall across Alaska, they're expected to see marginal increases in precipitation. However, some of the forms of precipitation have definitely been changing. 
And that's what's kind of indicated here in that um, this is a fairly new phenomena. This did not used to occur very often, but rain events in November and December are becoming much more common in the Arctic and in the tundra. Um, when we lived in Alaska, we experienced three of these, and the previous one before that was 70 years beforehand. So, and then since then, since leaving, they've had three more in the last four years. So it's uh, definitely becoming an interesting issue, um, particularly because animals have trouble accessing forage beneath layers of ice formed by this freezing rain. So they have a much harder time, and I think uh, some people in my winter ecology class definitely experienced that this year here, trying to dig through all those layers of ice. Um, with these uh, increases in precipitation, however, um, there's a phenomenon known as evapotranspiration, which is a combination of evaporation, basically water coming off of bodies of water into the atmosphere, and then transpiration, which is water coming out of both the soil and out of plants, back into the air. Currently, roughly about 75 to 100 percent of the summer precipitation already evaporates or transpires. And any new offsets in precipitation are expected not to be offset with additional precipitation. So we're looking at more net, net deficits um, in evapotranspiration. Um, additionally, what we've also been seeing over the last 100 years is roughly about a 45 percent increase in the growing season um, across Alaska. So basically, it, this is actually data from Fairbanks. Um, and uh, this is basically 1901, you had under 85 days. And now this last year, they had over, almost 125 days. So yeah, big, uh, big increases. So you might have to reclassify boreal forest just simply by uh, changes in growing season alone. So on top of that, kind of these temperature and precipitation, evapotranspiration, growing season that we're noticing, what sort of effects can we already see? Uh, a recent study came out, and uh, this basically looked at the decreases in the photosynthetic activity in the forest. And what we notice is that uh, the growing season has increased by roughly 45 over the past 100 years, as I mentioned, with no significant increase in precipitation. A lot of the regional um, winter runoff has increased. And this is probably likely associated with permafrost thawing. So permafrost, if you're not aware, is kind of permanently frozen ground. And it's no longer being permanently frozen because the temperatures are rising. And there's a lot of associated water with that. Um, so we're seeing also surface water has decreased. Um, and then the mean annual air temperature has also uh, increased quite a bit. And a result of this, if you notice um, here in the center, is that this area is known as browning. So basically, it's uh, not as photosynthetically active as it could be. So versus the Arctic is greening. So these are becoming much more photosynthetically active. So basically, what we're seeing is an increase in shrubs and actually trees going up onto the tundra. And the plants are getting a lot drier here in the Arctic or in the boreal forest. Um, on top of that, we've also seen a really large uptick in insect outbreaks. So these are not introduced species, um, but uh, their populations, for one reason or another, just decided to explode. And this is what happened with the spruce bark beetle, and notably on the Kenai Peninsula. And this, so if we notice here in this graph, and this is basically the outcome of a spruce bark beetle epidemic. So all these trees are white spruce trees, and they're all dead. They're all dead. Um, and basically, in uh, 1972 to 85, these red areas are spruce, spruce beetle outbreak. And then basically, 85 to 1998, we see that this, this just exploded. And what happened in those intervening years was the temperature did not get that cold over the winter for two successive winters. And as a result of that, um, the beetles were able to survive. And, they all, and in addition to that, the growing season happened to be just long enough where they could actually successfully move through their life cycle in one year instead of two. So their populations exploded. And they decimated 
the Kenai Peninsula. I don't know if anyone's gone there, but this area, there's not really any trees left anymore. They've been coming back, but uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty sad scale. Um, as I mentioned, these temperatures also affect the permafrost. Um, permafrost is permanently frozen ground, permafrost soil. And what we're noticing is over from basically 78 to today that this temperature, basically 65 feet down, is increasing. So from 17 up to, you know, near 20. And as soon as it hits uh, 32, 60 feet down, and uh, permafrost is gone. So it's uh, definitely happening in some places. Um, when we see it under like a black spruce forest, um, it produces what's known as a drunken forest. These trees start falling over, tipping over themselves a little bit. Um, also, this is happening underneath a lot of standing surface waters. So if we look 1951, both these images here, to 2000, uh, this publication was done in 2004, so I don't have data that supports that afterwards. But we noticed that some major shrinking. And what's happened is the permafrost melted and the water went into the ground. So this is happening across the boreal forest. Uh, this doesn't just affect you know, natural landscapes, but also the built environment as well. So this happens to be Dawson City in the Yukon Territories, um, pretty old historic place. And a lot of the buildings look like this, are collapsing because the permafrost that they're built on is melting. Um, the Alaska Pipeline, one of the largest infrastructure projects anywhere, um, was kind of built with that in mind. It has these little coolers up here, and they have these pipes, and they have these little coolers up here to kind of keep the permafrost from melting. And they buried it in places where there is no permafrost. So a lot of the uh, boreal forest is what's known as discontinuous permafrost, um, in that uh, it's not found everywhere. So. Um, you can't really talk about the boreal forest without talking about wildfires. Wildfires are the predominant disturbing, disturbance factor in the boreal forest and definitely in Alaska as well. So if you notice, this is a kind of little image of the boreal forest in Alaska, and all these red spots are past fire activity. So if you're noticing, pretty much the whole place is nearly burned at one point in time. Um, kind of what's happening, why is it burned? Well, it has a lot to do with you know, warm weather, little or no precipitation, low relative humidity, high winds. Most of these fires are started by lightning, not human starts like we find in a lot of other places. So a lot of it is lightning. And what we're really expecting to see, because of longer summers and higher temperatures, um, is a lot more fire activity. And that's precisely what we're seeing. Um, basically, the area burned in Alaska between 1950 and 1989 was roughly 27 million acres. Mind-boggling, huge area. Um, and you know, we definitely had some large past fire events in the 60s and the 70s. You know, definitely very periodicity here. Every five to eight years or so, there was kind of a big fire year. Then if we look at the uh, next 1990 to 2015, a um, lot more big fire years. Um, basically, at this time frame, we had 36,687,000 million, sorry, yeah, acres burned. Um, largest year of all time was 2004 with uh, over 6 million acres burned. The second largest happened to be this last year, 2015, with uh, just over 5 million acres burned. So 2004, that's what it looked like around Fairbanks. So all these red boundaries here are active fires and all this is smoke. So what does it look like in Fairbanks? That's Fairbanks on a clear day. That was Fairbanks in July of 2004. Uh, happened to correspond with basically 15 days that the air was hazardous. So they basically said, do not go outside. And then uh, 
31 days of that summer, basically the air quality was worse than Beijing's. <laughs> in uh, two, 20, 2005, it was nine days that uh, were hazardous. So they fires just happened to be further away from Fairbanks that time around. So, so <laughs> the culprit happens to be these guys mainly, which happens to be a third of the forest currently. Um, this is black spruce and uh, wildfire drives succession species distribution in the boreal forest. So fire is the major ecological player that drives all the rest of the system. So we have some black spruce here um, under fire. We see that these trees don't always burn all the way. And what happens is these are semi serotonous cones, so serotony basically means that they will release seeds given an ecological cue, and the ecological cue for these guys is fire. <laughs> okay, so they release their seed after they heat up, and they go, oh, goody, I released seed. I heat it up, I'll release my seed. So there goes the seed, da, 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 da. <laughs> so, on down, and we get all this new regeneration of black spruce. So they self regenerate back into more black spruce. Out uh, a short window of opportunity for this seed to fall, find a great place in order to regenerate and become a new thing. But what happens if the fire regime changes? Okay, This fire regime, this system basically was in place and has evolved over time for a fire return interval of roughly 200 years. So this has historically been the case, fire return interval, have a piece of land, Fire will happen again in another 200 years. What we're seeing now is it's 25% less. That fire return interval is now 150 years in general. So we can possibly shortcut the growing into big trees and having more fire, which then, well, hmm. How will changes in fire climate interact affect species distribution. Well, this is kind of two forest fires, one in 1990 and one in 1991. Then we had another one in 2005. What do you notice? Well, is there some overlap? So this area has what's known as a short fire interval. That fire happens to be between 2005 and 1990 and 1991. So this is a mature black spruce stand. This is roughly what happens in a long fire interval. Notice there's a whole lot of standing dead trees there, burn, charred, a lot of fireweed down there, um, kind of this mosaic burn pattern, quite a bit there. This is what happens in it. This is how it grows up and matures 20 years later into a whole bunch of new black spruce trees growing, being really happy. This is a short fire interval. Hmm. Where are the trees? Yeah. Wait, boreal forest. Conifer forest. Forest. Hmm. Okay. So, so this closely timed fire, short circuits, regeneration cycles. So if the fire return interval is long, you got some seed available, you get some good establishment. You get growth and survival. Short fire interval, you turn into a grassland. Not much there. But the question is, if we add seed, will something grow? So it's all really dependent on seed availability. So if black spruce seed is not available, maybe something else will come in. So in a sense, this black spruce is a failure in two points. One is. It's getting short-circuited, basically the regeneration, getting burned up second time around, which basically produces a lack of seed and an unsuitable substrate for that seed to grow on. In addition to this fire return interval, we also have what's known as fire severity. And fire severity is a measurement of how deep that organic layer was burnt. Okay? So how deep the organic layer was burnt. 
Did it take it all out? Is it down to mineral soil? Or is there some measures of it left over? So this fire severity affects seedbed quality significantly. Burning of organic soils influences patterns of post-fire recruitment. If you notice here, there's these little divots here. This is old kind of forest floor. You can tell that by the roots of the trees here. This is old forest floor. And this is areas where the fire smoldered and burned really deep. So there's these big divots that are happening. We have a bunch of fireweed in there. But this has a nice mosaic pattern and probably things will, uh, interesting patterns will then emerge. In addition to this, what we're seeing is that the tree seedling responses greatly is impacted by how severe that fire was, how deep that organic layer was burned. So in this top case here, we notice in the spruces, if the severity was relatively low, we happen to have a lot of spruces. If the severity was really high, we have very few spruce. The opposite is the case for aspen. If the burn severity is low, not much aspen, but if the burn severity is high, we have lots of aspen. In addition to just these individual trees, this actually has a large community effect as well. We're noticing that in low severity fires, we have a wide selection of woody shrubs and graminoids. And then a high severity, we happen to produce a lot of aspen and mosses. So the fire severity definitely affects large landscapes. Large landscapes. These fires can be gigantic. No. So the question is, how will shifting fire regimes influence tree distributions in the boreal forest? If serotony loses its advantage, what will succeed? And again, serotony is basically this ecological adaptation that trees have to release their seeds with some environmental cue. And that cue generally being fire. So regions that have experienced a novel disturbance regime will become more suitable for alternative tree species dominance, of course, if seed is available. So we can quite easily go from this black spruce dominant to a mixture of white spruce and some hardwoods, notably that of birch and aspen. This area, unfortunately, to this point in time, if you notice over these large expanses, not really any trees are growing because no seeds were available. So fire, this historic regime, what we saw was that you had fire, Fire return intervals were fairly long. The severity was relatively low as well. And we had tended to have a whole lot of black spruce coming back. <coughs> However, given moderate amounts of severity with some black spruce seeds, you can get a mixture. You're going to get white spruce, black spruce, and then also some, boss, some different deciduous trees. If the fire severity is really high, and you have to have very little black spruce seed available, you're going to basically shift completely, shift the total community dynamics into white spruce basically on upland well-drained sites and then these deciduous trees on other sites where seed was available. And if seed's not available, grasslands. And that's kind of what's been happening. So you may ask, who cares? What does this matter? Well, 165 of the 246 communities in Alaska are not connected to the road system. They're highly dependent on subsistence activities. These cultural ties that people have, the native peoples of Alaska, are tied to the vegetation. If you notice here, this boreal forest, the taiga, is also referred to as it's right here. The Athabascan people live in the taiga. They live in the forest. We have other groups, the Clinket down here, the Yupix, and then Inuit live in the tundra. Okay. So subsistence is a way of life in many places amongst many rural peoples in Alaska. Hunting, fishing, trapping, Picking berries is very important. 
One of the major game species in Alaska is that of caribou. What we notice is caribou does very well in black spruce stands that are 80 years old or older. There's lots of caribou in these stands. It produces the right assemblage of food available for caribou. Some of the projections that we're seeing into the future is that with more fires, increased severity and frequency, we're going to have less of this type, this spruce greater than 80 years on the landscape, which will then have major negative deficits in our caribou population. Moose, on the other hand, they happen to really like deciduous stands, trees like aspen and birch, that are ranging between about 10 and 40 years old. So these stands, this group of trees that are 10 to 40 years old. So what we can expect is in the near term, and we are actually seeing this, there's a, because of these huge flush of new fires that have just happened, we're producing ideal, more ideal moose habitat. But these grow up, and then we burn a whole bunch more, so we're going to have a large lag. So whenever you have this big crash, or potential crash, concerns happen. Lots of moose are harvested in Alaska. It's a major source of meat on the landscape for a lot of people, and this large crash is definitely a big concern. And then it's projected again because more burning that perhaps the landscape will be more suitable again into the future. So when we think about these communities, um, they're very much fixed to set location due to their infrastructure. Even though there's no road system, they're very tied to their schools, very tied to their airports in particular. Air travel is part and parcel with living in Alaska. You fly around the state. That's what you do. Prior to the 1950s, most Native peoples were generally consisted of more mobile family groups. They moved to where the game was, to where the fish was. Still, a lot of people who still do that. They go to their fish camps. They spend their summers catching, catching fish. However, they're much more tied to this landscape and their immediate surroundings much more so now than they have been historically. Uh, this increased reliance on modern technology, however, has some uh, negative consequences because it requires funding, requires money in order to keep these things going. Um, what we notice is that uh, percent of families below the poverty level in basically 2000, it's kind of the last time I looked at this, basically 18 to 24% of the population of people living in these communities, which if you think about the boreal forest, this is kind of where it is. This is Fairbanks right here. This is Denali. This is Denali Borough, which Alaska doesn't have counties, they have boroughs. So, um, so that's Fairbanks, that's Denali, and that's Anchorage right there, Juneau for your recollection here. And then this is Kodiak Island. Um, so huge swath of this area right here, which is basically the boreal forest, which is burning, has really high poverty levels. So native communities, you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these rural communities, what do they do in order to deal with this kind of triple threat of climate change, energy crisis, and uh, maintaining cultural integrity? So climate change increases fires risk. We're noticing with increased temperatures, increased rates of evapotranspiration, shortened fire churn intervals, we're having more fires. Fuel costs in Alaska range widely depending on how close you are to the road system. You have to fly this fuel in to these small little villages. And at the time, when I looked last a couple years ago, basically it ranged between six and twelve dollars a gallon. So what happens is, is it really drives rural urban migration. So people are flooding into the cities of Fairbanks and Anchorage. 
And it kind of threatens their indigenous communities. The uh, cultural boundaries are oftentimes stretched in ways that are, do not maintain good identity. So you have a lot of identity problems. Um, so things that could possibly be done is this kind of a map of biomass, which is basically trees, woody biomass. That uh, biomass harvest to reduce fire risk and provide fuel for heating. So local communities, instead of paying the six to twelve dollars a gallon for heating oil, which a lot of people do, as well as the fuel for their boats and four wheelers, um, can use much more local wood. So, in a sense, it could be a lot more ecologically sustainable. It's definitely much more economically viable because the resources are there, available to them. The costs are retained locally as wages. And in addition to that, if done well, if the forest can be managed well, both can be ecologically sustainable and improve moose habitat near villages. It's one of the biggest things about forest management in Alaska is that around a lot of these communities, you put out all fires. Anywhere close to a community, all fire is put out. What that does is build up a really unhealthy old stand that does not promote moose or caribou. So you have this buffer area surrounding each of these communities that is not good habitat. So what could be done? Well, pulling out a chainsaw and cutting more wood and promoting an enhancement of habitat is definitely a viable <laughs> option. And members of the university and Division of Forestry have been really working hard with uh, a lot of communities and kind of developing these plans. So, so I would like to, I uh, guess I was a little faster than I thought. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance. And uh, we'll take just a couple minute break. Um, before um, able to entertain any questions that you might have. So. You're talking about, I know we've talked about the, uh, the spruce bark beetle. Yep. It's the peninsula, the Kenai Peninsula, and it's, gone, it's moving its way around. Um, yeah, so the spruce bark beetle had kind of its epicenter um, outbreak. Let me pull up a map of all of Alaska. So down here, this area right here, was kind of like the epicenter, ground zero for the spruce bark beetle. This area was decimated. But in addition to that, so is this area right here. So with the spread of the like, decimation of such large stands of trees, uh -huh. being on the southwesterly coast, where the weather is coming up, across the Aleutians, through the Straits and up, right? Yep. Is that driving enough moisture up into those areas to try to, or to cause any effect on the annual fire outbreaks? Um, like with the permafrost melting as well this, as below this, permafrost? Yeah, this area doesn't really have permafrost. Yeah. It has some, um, so there's a mountain range that runs right here, mm -hmm. but where the forest is, this area has very little to small little patches of permafrost. Um, this side, there's basically a big mountain range here, and then you know some of the biggest glaciers around are on this side, um, high up in these mountains. But this area doesn't really have much permafrost. Where we see the discontinuous permafrost is kind of more up here. So does um, that increased moisture cause any change in the fire habits? Well, what we really saw here was um, interesting about moisture is that uh, that fire happened, and then it went through a number of droughts, years of drought as well, quickly following. Um, not really anybody clearly made a link between the two yet, but uh, what then subsequently happened though is, uh, since this is right near the water, timber industries came in and harvested all these trees. So, which then had major harvest um, impacts, because they're trying to basically salvage some of this revenue. Because right here at the southern tip is, uh, is Homer, and right around Homer is kind of more akin with southeast Alaska. 
Um, the trees grow really, really big there, really big, pretty fast. And uh, these trees got hammered. And there are some really big, high-value trees that, that uh, got harvested off, all off of this plateau here. So there was uh, a lot of upheaval after that, political upheaval about kind of what to do with salvage logging. So, yeah. Is there anything to be done about the, about the beetle issue? I mean, I know sometimes people can wait for bugs to try and prevent them. Yeah, so this, this, uh, this one kind of ran its course. Um, that outbreak kind of ran its course. We're seeing some minor outbreaks scattered around, but nothing seems to be quite it was kind of the perfect storm. These trees were all roughly the same age. They were, you know, kind of stressed from drought. Um, you know, it's definitely a concern, but uh, there's not a lot that can be done, unfortunately. And that was spruce bark beetle. Um, there's other ones, like this yellow area, and particularly what I worked on was an aspen leaf miner that has persisted in Alaska for nearly 20 years. and. Uh, the previous longest outbreak ever, Aspen Leaf Miner, was eight in Wisconsin. So nobody really knows why it's lasting for 20 years. And uh, it's seriously stressing the aspen trees because it defoliates the leaves. So every summer they kind of flush their leaves and then the leaves get eroded away. So they can't put on the energy stores that they need. So they're kind of running out of steam. They're getting really weak. So that's another big outbreak that's happening. We see lots of, you know, in forested systems, we tend to see lots of small ones. These really large ones are kind of unprecedented. Um, unfortunately, down this way, all the way down southern British Columbia, up north, there's another beetle that's kind of really decimating the forest. But that's not in Alaska yet, so. Yes? If you were to widen your view, um, to the east. Yep. Um, what's happening in northern Canada and then? So here in the Yukon, uh, Yukon Territories is right here. Um, and then it kind of stopped. Basically, it's this outline right here. Uh, Yukon Territory, southern Yukon Territory is currently being hit by a, a um, the pine bark beetle. And that's the one that's kind of currently all the way down the spine, basically British Columbia, Alberta. Um, Interestingly enough, there's another tree species that's not present in Alaska that is in the Yukon. It's the uh, lodgepole pine, um, which, miraculously enough, did not enter this system. So it's like this natural barrier, even though it's a, you know, a line on a map. But that line is holding back the <laughs> lodgepole pine. So in that area, um, you know, right here at least, there is a lot of. Uh, Willow that's being chewed up by a, a willow um, blotch miner, and that's coming down the Yukon River. So it kind of had the epicenter right here, and it's moving down the Yukon River and killing off all the willow along the riverbank, so, which is not so good. Are all of these uh, bugs aided and abetted by this warming that you spoke of? Yeah, well, um, we're not sure about the aspen leaf miner. We know that. It's pretty tough, resilient bug. It can overwinter at negative 60. It, it, its behavior hasn't really changed much. Um, doesn't seem to respond one way or another with temperature. It just seems to persist because there's plenty of aspen trees. So I, I, we, we're not really sure. So a lot of studies have been on it, but nobody really has a definitive answer on that one. The blotch miner happens to be uh, a little different story on that one. It, uh, it seems to be responding positively with warming temperatures. And the spruce bark beetle is one of the few that actually has a clear correlation between you know, warming, growing, increasing growing season, and uh, multiple cycles that happen. Yeah? Probably a lot of reasons behind the increase in fire severity. But is it primarily because the magnitude of these stands of insect killed? Black spruce? Or no, they, it's, the black, black spruce are typically pretty hardy. They don't tend to succumb to, nothing seems to eat them. So but the best way to describe them is that black spruce are born to burn. So they're highly resinous. Yeah, they're highly resinous to begin with. 
And um, the severity has to do with more warmer summers, lower humidity, longer summers, and the snow is leaving faster, so it's not recharging the ground. So the ground, the moisture in the ground is a lot lower as well. So those are mo the main drivers for the severity. Soil moisture, decreased humidity, and increased winds that we're seeing as well as a result so of this. So more crown fires? Uh, yeah. Hotter fires? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hotter, much more intense. So, you know, kind of. Well, it jumps down, right, Brian? Remember talking to you about that? Yeah. yeah, so these are like gnarly, nasty crown fires that just like torch everything. These, there is a, if you, there was one YouTube video I think I showed to some of my students. It's Tetlin National Wildlife Refuge, which is basically on the Yukon border. And they're flying around in a fixed wing plane filming this. And, they're, and the column was, I think they said it was 30,000 feet up. And trees were flying in the sky like 10,000 feet up, just creating this giant vortex. And you know, you don't come close to this thing. And this, this was a million acre fire. Just flying around in the sky. Yeah. So that is a lot of fuel. You know, there I was just at a conference and they were talking about a watershed that was like, I want to say 4,000 acres in Colorado, mind you. But uh, that fuels there was basically like three Hiroshima's for 4,000 acres. And these were like 10,000 acre fires. So this is a whole lot of carbon being pumped into the air. And then on top of that, besides where you're burning the vegetation, you have thousands of years of moss that have accumulated underneath it. And then a lot of places, permafrost, which can be thousands of feet thick, that are melting and releasing and decomposing. So what happens in the boreal does not stay in the boreal. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like Vegas. It goes everywhere. Any other questions? So if you want to know more about you know growth and fire, I, I can talk about this um, all day. So. Yes. Are there any successful models again? You know, if you're going east, but um, in Europe, northern Europe, if similar forests, like northern Europe has been so altered its structure, its forest composition is so structured, it's not really, it's a managed system. And Russia? Uh, the most pristine, viable, intact, non-touched by human boreal forest is Alaska. So next to that is basically portions of Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. Um, Interestingly enough, Kamchatka is basically was getting developed and then the Russian economy tanked, so people walked away. So ecologically, it's returning to more natural states. But a lot of Russia has been heavily managed in the past. They've really relied heavily on their forest resources, much more so than Alaska has. So kind of the intact forest structure. The uh, boreal of Canada, there's Canadian logging is uh, really big. It's a huge player. They've uh, done a lot on their landscape. Uh, the Yukon Territories, they don't grow trees quite as well as Alaska does. So, so their logging activities is really minimal to almost non-existent. But they also have all these same fire issues. All across Canada, there's huge fires that are in the boreal as well. So this kind of this model you just add, as you move into Canada, you add a couple more players um, in terms of jack pine and also uh, lodgepole pine as you kind of move east. It's very similar situations. Any kind of black spruce becomes much less prevalent in those stands, and these other two, much more so. Yeah. Yes? Does fires, uh, the history of fire suppression Yes, it does. It, uh, yeah, it does. Um, around the communities, um, as I mentioned, 
There was a recent study that just came out by Calfi, Monica Calfi, who uh, basically looked at fire suppression and its impact on fire severity in Alaska as well. And we're seeing higher severe fires close to communities because of years of fire suppression. So just same sort of phenomenon that we see in the lower 48 in the right. West. So this, you know, it's very much on a minimalist scale. Like fire suppression, you know, basically only happens right around these communities and the rest of it is basically free to burn until it threatens the community. So, because managing it is kind of ridiculous because it's huge. So you can only really manage around that. Except there's a few exceptions to that. Um, those are native allotments, um, Alaska native allotments. And then also um, those under treaty have to be, those fires have to be put out which is a BLM challenge. So BLM has the smoke jumpers that go in and jump in and try to protect these native allotments that are scattered all around. So, yeah. Yes? Hey, Brian. Thanks so much. Are, are there any other subsistence animal species that are being uh, greatly affected by this? Yeah, yeah these are, are just some of the biggest ones. That, that, are, that are affecting like the indigenous people? Yeah. yeah. Like what? Well, from, yeah, they basically, you know, when fire comes around, um, basically taking out streams, you have all the salmon, um, particularly in these gravels, and basically you get chalking of wood and charcoal into the streams that disrupt the gravels for the, for the salmon to spawn, so that's a problem. That's why a lot of the argument has been by the, by the native populations that put out fires and impacts our ability to travel on the landscape as well. So there are trails, because you know you have to make trails because there's no roads, so for your four-wheelers and snowmobiles. So these trails are set access points for trapping, for hunting, for fishing, and in order to establish them is a lot of work. And once you have a fire come through, then afterwards you get this reflush and maybe new vegetation that then chokes out, chokes out your trails. So in order to access those previous hunting and fishing grounds becomes more difficult. And in addition to that, it definitely impacts the quality of the, that habitat for years to come. So, you know, since people are more fixed on their landscape because of the kind of the villages, the infrastructure they have developed at each of these places, um, they're dependent on transportation means in order to get out and access, fortunately, hunting grounds and fishing grounds that are further and further away becoming more of a challenge and more of a cost. Yeah, I, I don't know any specifically papers, but there, I can find some if you want more. Anybody else? Yes, sorry. So I know due to climate change, the moose population has been in rapid decline due to the deer tick. I was wondering, will that affect Alaska eventually due to the... Yeah, it's the moose tick, actually, which is yeah, really interesting. Tick, yeah. yeah. Um, they... I don't know. Um, there's uh, new signs of ticks now, actually, in Alaska. Ticks weren't really a problem, but they've just started coming in um, to this area, up through here. Um, I suspect, you know, any disease that affects an animal will eventually make its way, you know, invasive species are finding their way, you name it, they're finding their way. <coughs> um, yeah, specifically, I don't know, I, you know, I lived in Minnesota for a while and then you know, Grand Isle was, and the tick burden that those moose carry is just unbelievable. Okay. Well, again, I'd like to thank you all for coming.